That's Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. What is it that brings you joy? What is it? Is there something specific in your life that just makes you happy? Makes your heart full? Makes you feel good? Enriches your life in some way? Maybe it's your husband or wife. Trust that's the case. Or maybe it's your children. You just joy in, in everything that, that they're involved in. Or maybe it's your friends. You have some very precious relationships that you enjoy with others and you're just absolutely thrilled to be able to spend time with them and it just fills your heart with joy to get to do so. Certainly, even with all of these aforementioned people involved in our answer, it ought to obviously be the Lord, shouldn't it? The Lord ought to bring us joy in our relationship with Him. That's what He wants to do. As long as we're willing to, to accept the joy that He offers and participate in the process, we are blessed to be a people loved by God. King David was a man who many times in the Psalms would write about things for which he was grateful. This morning I'd like us to think about one of those particular Psalms and let's see what he was joyful about and find some application this morning. Open your Bibles, please, to the 16th Psalm. Psalm 16. We read, Preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. O oh, my soul, you've said to the Lord, you are my Lord. My goodness is nothing apart from you. As for the saints who are on the earth, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Their sorrows shall be multiplied who hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood I will not offer nor take up their names on my lips. O oh, Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of your life and your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Consider firstly this morning that David was joyful in the Lord's person. Just in who he is. Again, verses 1 and 2, Preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. O my soul, you have said to the Lord, You are my Lord, my goodness is nothing apart from you. In you I put my trust. Always we need to be careful where we put our trust, right? Every place is not proper. Every situation is not appropriate. We don't invest in situations or circumstances or even in people that are not going to be proper and good and right. But when we think about the Lord, we think about how all that's always the right place to put our trust. Sometimes in financial matters, we, we wonder, well, where should I put my money? Where should I invest? What company is it that would be a good place to invest in? What particular 
uh, type of, of fund or what place is good and safe and, and right? Is it the tree out behind the house? Is it, you know, where is it? Nothing's 100% there, is it? Because everything we're talking about is earthly. God will give you a guaranteed return on your eternal investment all the time. All the time. You'll never be disappointed. Now there's going to be ups and downs here. As the market of life shifts and turns, but spiritually, eternally, guaranteed return on that investment. I mean, that is a blessing that we need to really be excited about and, and trust in ultimately to provide our peace. He says, my goodness is nothing apart from you, and isn't that the case? We have absolutely nothing in our lives that we bring to the table except what he can provide and make good. We can take the very best we have and come short of what we need, but God can take that commitment and through the blood of his son Jesus, he can cause that decision to be proper and, and wonderful and good. The story is told of a very aged Christian woman who earlier in life had memorized much of the Bible. As the years had passed, so had a great deal of her memory. Until the end, she could remember only one verse. 2 Timothy 1.12 I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him until that day. As time passed, only portions of that verse were remembered. Eventually it got to that which I have committed to him was all she could remember. And then at the very close, it was just one word that she repeated over and over. Him. 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 You might say that's really all we need to remember ultimately is Him. It is in Him that we place our trust. Everything about us begins with Him and everything about us ends with Him. We need to be joyful in His person, who He is. But consider also that we need to be joyful in the Lord's people. In verse 3, as for the saints who are on the earth, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. I haven't bragged on you guys in a while. And I'm not going to this morning. But uh, <laughs> no, we are blessed to have a wonderful fellowship of brothers and sisters here. There are so many good things about this congregation that the Lord has established and blessed. We're coming upon 16 years since we began as a congregation. In fact, just in a few weeks, it will have been 16 years. Mary Alice and I have been blessed to be here every second of that time. And we are grateful for that. I'm grateful for all of you. You think about the relationships that have been enjoyed over the years, and for some it's been a very short period of time. But wherever we fall in the continuum of that time frame, we need to never take for granted that the saints of God, His people, they're the excellent ones. Because He's made it that way. We have the opportunity to, to know and to be with people who have blessed our lives and who have seen wonderful things take place as a result of that interaction. We never take that for granted and know of the joys and the blessings that are found in that. Galatians 6, 9, and 10, let us not grow weary while doing good for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, but especially to those who are of the household of faith. It's all about people, not about things. 
as hard as it is for us to keep that in mind in our daily journeys. The story is told of a famous movie actress from years ago who was robbed of her jewelry and deeply disrawed and it was affecting her acting in this particular movie because she just couldn't overcome because these things were very precious to her. She was angry, she was mad, she was upset, she was every kind of emotion you could imagine, she was feeling it. Her director took her aside and said, I am much older than you are and if there's one great truth I have learned about life, it is this. Never cry over anything that can't cry over you. A lot of truth to that, I believe. We have the opportunity in our relationship with each other to have great joys together and yes, great sorrows together. But what a blessing it is to be able to have a together. To not walk through this world alone, but to have those who worship and journey with us, that's excellent, as the psalm says. Consider also he was joyful in the Lord's portion. Verses 5 and 6, O Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. There's that looking over there and seeing the inheritance that is yet to come. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6 says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? We may not have everything we want, but in the Lord we have everything we need. We have every blessing that truly matters in the long range look at things. A song that is taken from this particular verse, the young people will remember especially. Lamentations 3, 22 to 25, through the Lord's mercies were not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. Continue also to think about the fact that we also should be joyful in the Lord's principles. We might say that we really don't know the Lord unless we're willing to heed and to accept the things he says. In verse 7, I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. It is a precious and wondrous thing to have a glimpse into the mind of God. When we pick up His Holy Word, these 66 books that are compiled together that God through the Spirit decided to share with mankind for something to read and understand and to have a glimpse into what life is to be. We look at the 39 books of the Old Testament and we see so many things that the Lord has provided to His people and we see a history of His interaction from the very beginning of time with mankind, with His own special people and with the laws and the instructions that He sought to be a part of their heart and not just so that things could be shared with them on the basis of some stone tablets, but so that they might have their hearts carved with his message through their acceptance of who he is. We see the prophets working and we see the message being shared down through time and it frequently was a message of come on back. All right, you've gone away too far, come on back. Come back to what? To a specific message God had intended all along. 27 books of the New Testament shares with us in the very beginning the message of Jesus Christ the gospel account of his coming and living and dying and being raised. The acts of the apostles as the message was going forth from Jerusalem and teaching people the way of salvation. 
people began to be a part of something very special, the church of our Lord. And as people responded in faith, they were added to that body as people continue to be added today. On the basis of the same principles that were being shared then, you've got the, the fulfillment of prophecy in the new that were presented in the old. And then the letters to the churches and the conclusion of comfort to, to the church through John in the Revelation letter. All involving the principles of God to mankind. He has given us counsel. He has instructed us. This is not all the mind of God. But everything in it is the mind of God. It is holy. It is righteous. It is the one holy book on the face of this earth. In Psalm 119, verse 100, he said, I understand more than the ancients because I keep your precepts. I have restrained my feet from every evil way that I may keep your word. I have not departed from your judgments. For you yourself have taught me how sweet are your words to my taste. Sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. But especially as we think about the context of what he says back in Psalm 16, 7. He instructs me in the night seasons. We need a lamp to our feet and a light to our path when we go through the nights of life. Now I think specifically he's talking about simply the difference between day and night here. When darkness comes as well as when the light comes, sometimes it's easier to do the right things in, in the light, in the day, than in the night. The Bible talks about how things that are shameful are many times done under the cover of darkness. But if you expand that out to truly the concept of seasons, there are night seasons to our lives. They're hard times, challenging times. But the same God that was there in the daytime and in the wonderful, growing, fruitful seasons is the same God that is there during those night seasons. We need to remember that. He's not gone anywhere. He is still there. And we need to make sure that we seek Him and His will. Then lastly, we need to be joyful in the Lord's protection. In verse 8, I've set the Lord always before me because he's at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope for you will not leave my soul in Sheol or the place of the dead. Nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The ultimate protection that the Lord provides is not from disease. We ought to pray about it though. He wants us to. It is not from sorrow and challenge that come in our lives. Although He wants us to pray about that and we should. But the ultimate protection that he provides is that spiritual welfare that leads to eternity with him. It is the cleansing of the soul. It is the causing of one to have the spiritual health that is needed to work through the challenges of now and yet even to be excited about what yet will be in the coming days. To be in a place where there is no disease, nor death, nor tears, nor separations of any kind, where time is no longer measured. There were some in Jesus' day that he wished to embrace, but they would not be willing. He says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her, 
How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. If we're not willing, then we're going wanting. We've got the plan, and there's not another one. If we reject this one, we've rejected the only one. There is no alternative. But the Lord and His message for our lives. We have a lot of things to delight in along with King David. But it will only happen if we allow Him to embrace us. And we embrace Him back in faith. But think about what is mentioned in verse 10. Because verse 10 is mentioned in the New Testament in a very special way concerning a very special individual. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. In your translation, the words Holy One may be capitalized. There's a reason for that. Because in Acts chapter 2 and verse 31, the Holy One that is referenced there is Jesus Himself. And in that precious sermon to those on the day of Pentecost, it is the Holy One Jesus that was lifted up as the one that some of them had been guilty of crucifying specifically, but all were guilty because of their sin and a lack of response. They were called to a response on that occasion on the basis of the fact that Jesus lives. He's not been corrupted in the grave. He rose from the dead. And because of His holiness, all people have opportunity to respond with their decisive faith as He called them to do in verse 38 specifically. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Back in Psalm 16, 4, we'll close with this sobering thought. It said, Their sorrows shall be multiplied who hasten after another God. There's no joy in the service of any other God. There's no hope in the service of any other God. It doesn't matter how popular that concept may be in our current world. It doesn't matter how your specific faith may be looked upon by someone else as being narrow-minded. What matters is that we respect the God of heaven who made us and has provided his will for us to make sure that we make that journey to heaven one day. And you know what? Let's take as many people as we can with us. It's going to require some courage. But because of what the Lord has provided, we've got things to be joyful about. May we point you to joy this morning and maybe your need for a public response as we stand and sing.